Hello, my name is Joseph Simpson, and presenting with me today are Lottie Stewart and Matt Lemire. Today we'll be talking a little bit about our experience in the math modeling competition in March. First, Lottie will explain a little bit about what the contest is, and then we will go into some detail about our specific challenge. And finally, we'll end with an opportunity for questions, which we will try to answer in the comments section below. What is the math modeling competition? First of all, I would like to discuss that there's two different types of competitions. There's the math modeling competition and the interdisciplinary contest in modeling. We participated in the math modeling competition while the interdisciplinary contest in modeling is focused more on specific disciplines such as engineering, data science, etc. So this competition brings students together from around the world to solve real world math problems. These problems challenge teams of students of one to three max to clarify, analyze, propose solutions to open-ended problems provided by the contest. This contest is of a duration of four days, where it starts on a Thursday and it ends on the following Monday, where students are able to analyze what the problem is and discuss what is the best method for solving it, and then having time to write a report or solution for their modeling. What was interesting about this competition is because of the novel coronavirus, instead of this competition only being held on one weekend, it was instead held on two separate weekends to allow for students to be able to work on a problem because if a certain weekend didn't work for them for whatever complications were happening due to the coronavirus, then they could work on it the following weekend. Our team worked on weekend two from March 5th through 9th, and we chose problem B, which was discussing what is the best 3D geometric shape for making a sandcastle. And without further ado, here's Joseph with discussing the challenge. So we had five parts to our problem that sort of build upon each other, but essentially our challenge was to design the best 3D geometric shape to use as the foundation for a sandcastle. Best meaning lasts the longest period of time in this case. Initially, this seemed like a ridiculously open-ended challenge and we sort of struggled to get a grip with it. So we ended up making some simplifying assumptions about the challenge to make it a little more manageable in just the one extended weekend that we had. Namely, that the beach is uniform, the waves are average and consistent, the rate of erosion only depends on the distance to the waves. Water only erodes the sand while in contact with it. Water can be modeled as tiny spheres. The only force that the water particles experience is gravity. Sand can be uniformly compacted. And lastly, the rain is really not different than the waves. Uh, we understand that the real interactions at a beach are far more complicated than this. This helps us make a start. We began our model on one and two dimensional beaches and developed this initial differential equation to describe the erosion in our system. Given our assumptions, it becomes apparent from the model that we want to be far from the waves, have a narrow front width, and make the ocean facing edge flat so that every part of the foundation will erode as slowly as possible. Later on, we began to look at bridge piers and seawalls for inspiration in three dimensions since they're engineered to last for a long time in coastal environments. We decided to maximize the surface area to build the biggest sandcastle, which led, us, led to us developing a square semicircle combination for the upper surface. For the sides, since we wanted to minimize the amount of contact that the water has with our foundation to reduce erosion, we turned to the brachistochrone curve problem. This is the famous problem of the curve of quickest descent and the solution turns out to be a cycloid curve, which you can see modeled on the lower right. This ideally should remove the water the quickest given our assumption that water is a small sphere that really only interacts with gravity. As you can see here, our solution combines most of our results from our various models. In the top view, you can see the seawall that we added to block waves in white, the cycloid curves on the sides in dark gray, and the building surface in light gray. And in the cross-sectional view, you can get a sense of the heights and curves at play in our solution. I'm not sure if I mentioned it before or not, but we decided to add a seawall at the front with the same cycloid curve on one side 
and sort of trapezoidal buttress on the other. And I think this is much more clearly visible in the cross-sectional view. Next, Lottie will talk about the second part of the challenge. So the second challenge to this problem was a solution for the type of sand and the water to sand ratio for this 3D geometric shape. When looking at different sources that discussed what is the best type of sand, there was one source that discussed how sand created from glacial sheets rubbing against each other was the best source of sand because these fine particles were actually rigid or jagged instead of them being very smooth and circular. This provides a way for friction to catch among the different sand particles so they could then hold with each other and catch instead of just sliding past each other. So from doing this research and looking at these different sources, it was discussed that sand created from glacial sheets rubbing against each other and creating this very rough and coarse sand would be best. However, it's better if these sand particles are small so then there's less space between the particles to create looseness and said they could be more tight and compact. When looking at the optimal sand to water ratio, it was seen that one part water to 99 parts sand was the optimal ratio because this ensures that there was a bridge between the different sand particles to connect them together and bond while still leaving it dry enough so that it did not become too, I guess you could say, soup-like and muddy and just run off each other. As can be seen on this slide, there are two different mathematical models for the ratio of sand to water. This ratio was found in a nature journal about constructing sand castles, and in the first equation, it demonstrates what is the max strain strain and stress the sand particles can endure before collapsing, where the following variables can be read. So this is all about what is the best ratio for building a sand castle, correct? So with doing this, you need to find what is that balance of the stress and strain for the sand castle, because if there's too much water and it's too saturated, it will fall apart, but if it's too dry, it will also crumble. So this provides what is the, also the best compaction for the sand castle, so it doesn't cripple as well. By finding the optimum strength, which is G, it can be also found in the following equation, where you can see the different variables, and this discusses as well what is the best strength for the sand castle, and using the surface tension between the liquid seawater and air, which is what we are working with. Once these calculations were completed, ratio for the ideal minimum stress and strain was a 1 to 99 ratio, which verifies what would be best for this construction of the sand castle. The following figure then shows this relationship for counting for the various surface of the sand particles, where you can look at the varying heights or peaks and dips with the sand particles if you look at them. If you take the average of it, then you can say that it is approximately a sphere or that it is a circle because of this. So this demonstrates how the contact of the two uniform sand particles can be accounted for and how you can approximate the radius of the sand particles because of this. So in summary, the best distribution of water to sand is a 1 to 99 ratio and then to have a type of sand that is not completely uniform and smooth but a little coarse to allow for catching between the sand particles as well as to have them be as small as possible so then there's minimal space between the sand particles so compaction is easier. Next up, Joseph will discuss about the third issue. The third part of the problem we had was to adjust the model in case of rain. As we briefly mentioned earlier, we chose to model the rain particles in the same way as the waves. That is, the water molecules are basically tiny spheres that only really experience gravity and maybe a little friction. We decided that for the most part, our solution could remain the same, but in order to increase the runoff of the flat upper surfaces, we decided to pitch the surface a little bit, taking inspiration from soccer and football fields. Um, next, Matt will talk a little bit more about the last parts of this challenge. In the fourth section, we looked at some of the possible alternative strategies that we could use to make our sandcastle last longer. This meant that we had to look outside of what was required for the problem. 
Our group got a little bit more creative on this side of the project, and we decided to interpret our research for this section from the perspective of a boy who himself builds a sandcastle. A study done by Dr. Dan O'Bonn of the University of Amsterdam shows that sandcastles have a better chance of surviving when they are built in areas that typically experience colder and rainier weather. The high air humidity and low temperature help to prevent the evaporation of the water that holds the sand particles together. Some of the longer lasting sandcastles actually apply a cornstarch glue combination in tandem with everything else. Cornstarch is good because it is a reliable thickening agent that can help to make the sand more compact. And when you combine it with glue, it actually provides more adhesion between the sand particles in the structure itself. Our group also discussed using an extended seawall structure made of large rocks or stones that are stacked on top of each other and then covered in wet sand. Larger rocks have more mass and inertia and are therefore more likely to resist the incoming tides. Stacking them on top of each other increases the seawall's overall strength and it reduces the amount of seawater that the sandcastle gets exposed to. Thus, it slows down the rate of erosion. A third alternative strategy involves digging a hole in the center of the foundation and installing an umbrella to act as a canopy for the sandcastle. A plastic lined moat surrounding the sandcastle at its base would collect all the ocean and rainwater and prevent it from completely washing away the structure. And in extension to that, we would install a small pump at the base of the moat to divert the water to small mist filters that are installed on the umbrella. The filters would be distributed in such a way that would help to keep the sandcastle moist at a constant water to sand ratio of 1 to 99. In the last section, we had to summarize our model and our results for non-technical readers of the vacation magazine Fun in the Sun. In the article, 13-year-old Michael Herman takes on the challenge of building the ultimate sandcastle. In line with our research, Herman had to construct his castle on an elevated foundation as to avoid minimal contact with the tidal waves. The side of the castle facing the sea featured a seawall that helped to protect against the incoming tides, and it also acted as a windbreaking structure. The foundation itself was curved upwards to allow gravity to slow down the incoming tide and prevent it from reaching the castle. Herman curved the corners of the foundation to redirect water around the castle and minimize the amount of sand removed from the base. Instead of a sea wall on the back of the castle, Herman carved a curved edge in favor of a flat edge to again reduce the amount of water erosion. So did the sand castle last for more than a day? According to Herman, it actually lasted for two days. When he was asked if he would make the sand castle again and what he would do differently, he said yes, but he noted that he would use more materials in the future and not just wet sand. Joseph will now finish with closing remarks. As we briefly mentioned at the beginning, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below. We will do our best to address them in the next few days. If not, thanks for watching and we hope you stay safe out there.